Okay, it's a little hot in here already. So please, please try to bear with me. So my name is Ben. I am your friendly neighborhood transgender person <laughs> at Eastern Illinois University. I went here for my undergrad, so I've been here for four years, and now I'm a graduate student here, so going on six, holla. <laughs> so here's what we're going to talk about today. Here's how we're going to set up the room. We are going to talk about transgender youth. You're sitting, you're looking at me like, what? What does that mean? What are you even talking about? Don't worry, I'm going to tell you. But in case you don't know this about me, chances are you don't. I love superheroes so much, I wear them on my socks. <laughs> so we're going to take this at the theme of superheroes, because this is how I believe in educating, that we are the superheroes, right? We are the people who get to grant the superpowers and tell the people what's going on. We're the people who avenge the city, we let you know where the trouble is, and then we try to fix it, OK? So we're going to turn to our friend Peter Parker. You might know him as Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. That is education. Education is power. We have the responsibility to push it forward. OK, so I'm going to say some things. And you might be like, hmm? So this is what I need from you. When I say, do you understand? I need you to give me a peace sign if you get it. I get it. And if you don't understand, wait, what? I need you to go, <laughs> OK, keeps you engaged, lets me know where you're at. So I'm going to ask some questions throughout. And if you really don't know at any point, I need you to go. Or if you're feeling it, give me a peace sign. Cool? So let's start. Basic vocabulary. Transgender. That means that is a term for people whose gender identity is different from their sex assigned at birth. The end. That's as simple as it is. So let's take me. I was assigned female at birth. I'm transitioning to male. So my sex is female. My gender is male. They don't match. I'm transgender. Cisgender. My guess is that most of you in this room are cisgender. Cisgender means everything's matchy-matchy. No problem. <laughs> you wake up in the morning. You look in the mirror. You're like, I'm good. Everything matches. Put on your clothes and go to work. <laughs> and then the dreaded it. So if you are talking about a person and you are not sure of what their gender is, you might say to your friend, what is it? Mm. And from the depths of my bat cave, I will rise up and <laughs> slap you on the wrist and say, quit that. Never say that ever again. It is by far the most offensive term you could ever refer to someone as. Here's why. Lampshade, that's an it. Um, things in your house, a table, that's an it. Would you ever call a puppy an it? No. So why would you call a person an it? You wouldn't, because you're respectable human beings. Basic chart, um, just to give us some do's and don'ts. Terms to use, transgender, gender identity, and gender expression. So I'm transgender, my gender identity is male, and my gender expression is male. You can say, how do I know what somebody's gender expression is? I like to think of gender as an art. We are constantly doing gender. So when I got up today, I said, I'm going to put on my tie, I'm going to put on my sweater, got my shoes on, got my little Superman socks. I'm presenting to you as male, right? So that's how you can kind of pair up where people's gender identity and gender expression are. Where are we at? OK, good. Usage examples. So something people often worry about, especially educators, is how do I refer to trans students or how do I refer to people in my workplace? A transgender person, transgender advocate, transgender inclusion. Things you would not want to say. A transgendered person works with me. Basic vocabulary. It doesn't even sound right. If you're in a sentence and you're like, yeah, they're transgendered, <laughs> this is what it reminds me of. I go to the mall with my girlfriend, and she's walking in, into the Macy's counter, and they're like, do you want to get transgendered? Like, the, to me, that seems like a makeover. Like, we're being transgendered. This week on Home Extreme Makeover, we're transgendering somebody. No, it doesn't work like that. Stop it. A transgender. Go home tonight, sit and have dinner with your significant otter, and you say, a transgender came and spoke to me today. 
a transgender? <laughs> a transgender, really? Picture my face when you say that. Transgenders. To me, this sounds like a cult. <laughs> I joined the transgenders last week. Transvestite. A no. This is Rocky Horror Picture Show. Um, not me. And tranny. Circa 1960, 1970, this was a pretty big slur. Usually when referring to trans women, this is a term that people use. Um, then keep avoiding these, sexual identity. Um, transgender is not a sexual orientation. So this does not affect who I am attracted to. This merely deals with gender. So it is not the same. Tra being transgender does not mean I'm attracted to one or two or different types of people. It is merely focusing on gender. Um, and transgender identity. <sighs> The best way, if you're trying to be inclusive of trans students in your classroom or trans people in your workplace, is just to say, I have someone under the trans umbrella, students who are non-binary, because non-binary encompasses anybody who strays away from the gender line. So anybody who deviates out of that, that would be in non-binary. OK, so then we're going to look at some numbers because I'm a little nerdy, and I think that it helps people to be able to encompass um, how big problems really are when we can see the data. A big part of this is statistical literacy, and sometimes when people are reporting statistics, um, they make it seem like a bigger problem than it is, or they like that drama, so you know when you pick up a New York Times and it's like 98% of Americans love Beyonce. <laughs> No, 98% of the people in this survey love Beyonce. <coughs> so that's something to keep in mind, too. However, this particular survey I'm going to show you is out of the National Council of Transgender Equity, and it is the National Transgender Discrimination Survey. Um, this is out in several schools across the nation. There are a lot of students who take this. Um, so you have your respondents of 6, 000, over 6,000 adults and then a, close to 300 6th through 12th graders. We know that this can give us enough of a sample size to really gauge what's going on. So I realize that it's a little little. That's a little little. So let's look at the numbers in this one. So we're going to look at adults to begin with on this first line. These are people who report daily. This is not weekly. This is not yearly. This is daily verbal abuse, 76%. Um, physical abuse, the 35% and sexual abuse at 18%, uh, 11%. And what I feel I should um, be able to articulate clearly when it comes to that sexual abuse is that when it comes to transgender people, often we are seen as objects. Um, and so people feel that they can say or do things to people who might be transgender that you would never do to anybody else. Some examples of this would be touching inappropriately in the workplace, um, at school, cat calling, um, inappropriate groping in the hallways and things like that. So when we're looking at students reporting, we're looking at hallway activity in the bathroom, comments like that. So when you look at transgender people, that's why I said never say it, because a majority sometimes of people review us as an object. And by um, doing things like that sexual abuse, it only further takes that home. So then we're going to go to the next bar, and we're going to look at trans youth. So 13 to 20, 87% daily. <coughs> so in this sample size, that's a very large number of students saying, somebody said something to me in the hallway, a teacher made a remark, somebody outed me, um, things like that. 44% with the physical abuse. This was noted as touching, kicking, punching, slapping, um, being shoved and then we don't have the data for the sexual abuse. We're going to go down. So then we're going to look at M to F trans youth. What's M to F? That stands for male to female. Opposite of me, right? Because I'm female to male, so male to female. You just switch the letters. Cool? Cool. 31, and then again you have 87% on that verbal, 35 on the physical, and 16 on the sexual. And then you can go down and see students who identify like myself, 71%, 17%. What do you notice between these two lines? 
in those numbers. Talk to me. This figure for male to female? Mm -hmm. the exactly. And why do you think that is? Because I feel like when people view somebody that's gone from male to female, they view them as losing their masculinity. Mm. Masculinity. Yes. That is exactly right. Good job. This bump to both of you. That is exactly right, because when we talk to people who transition over to female, their male counterparts say, get away from me, you've lost your masculinity, your gender identity means nothing to me now, and it makes them uncomfortable, because what they had seen as masculine is over to them, and then they lose sight of who that person is on the inside. And so that's a really big problem. Violence within trans women, so M to F, is much more prevalent, and especially of trans women of color. Constantly in the news will you see reports of people being beaten or found dead and things like that. So there is a big difference here. And then in the final line, we have trans youth um, in Philadelphia at a 96% on the verbal and 83% on the physical. Next slide. So that was fun and dismal, wasn't it? Um, this is what I want to say, though, after spewing all that data at you, is that trans people do not live inherently sad lives. I do not wake up in the morning sad, <coughs> dreading going to work or dreading going to class. That is not the life that I lead. I get up, take a shower, I eat my bagel, I go to work, I sit there, I go to class, I sit there, I go home, I play on my iPad, I go to bed. Okay? I don't sit in wallow in my sadness about my gender and my sex not lining up. That is not how it is for us. However, it is just how people react to much of us. Does that make sense? Yes, where are we at? Okay. So just the breakdown of those facts um, into another um, setting. So you have your 82%. They feel unsafe at school. Why would they feel unsafe at school? Look. <laughs> That's Donna. <laughs> yeah. yeah, people are mean. Yeah. Anything else? But you asked why. Why would trans youth be bullied at school? Because for their ostracized, um, because they're kind of the different mm -hmm. group than. I mean, yep. like it's, it's more like them against the world when they're at school. Exactly. That's like if there is if there is sex education at school, it doesn't cover this area. Yep. <laughs> yep. LGBTQ. Yeah. Sorry, you better Google that. It's, it's how a lot of youth look at it. They don't have allies. They don't have allies. That's important. I was going to say situationally, I know a lot of classes a lot of times split between boy and girl. Mm -hmm. Yep. They have a lack of exposure, so mm -hmm. they don't know how that necessarily interact or be Exactly. I feel like two uh, schools are very like gender exclusive where they should be gender inclusive. Like mm -hmm. we have female male bathrooms, but there's no bathrooms for somebody that doesn't or same thing with locker rooms, somebody that exactly. doesn't want to label themselves. Yes, that is completely, completely true. I think high school is a place where stereotypically male and female behavior is at its strongest. Mm -hmm. And in the cycle of your life, I think people are you know, trying really hard to be that girl or be that boy. And this is what girls do, and this is what boys do. Exactly. So you have a broader divide than you do probably at any other time in your life when you're that age. Exactly. You guys are awesome. Um, that was great. So if this were great, I'd give you all A's. But it's not, so sorry. Um, <laughs> however, you are exactly right and you are in the correct frame of thinking when you're thinking about this because when students go to school um, and those who identify as trans this is often the most difficult part of their day and then you have to assume for children who have problems at home they're coming to school as an escape and then it only gets worse so that's when we look at suicide rates in trans youth um, we know just broadly that LGBT lesbian gay bisexual transgender youth 
have very high suicide rates as compared to our heterosexual counterparts through the roof. And then when you add transgender youth, um, you can almost double that because these are the people who get kicked out of their homes and then are refused entry into homeless shelters or into um, domestic violence shelters as well because people don't want to deal with it. Um, and you know, when we're sitting in here, we're like, oh no, how could you do that? But if you're running something or you're in a classroom, your first instinct is pr to protect the majority of the group rather than one student. And so in that time, a lot of our non-binary kids get lost. And this is where people turn and they don't know where to go. So then we have the 90% experiencing transphobic, transphobia, uh, harassment from peers and most reported that it happened often or frequently. Um, next slide. And then 76% reported that they had the experienced, um, unexperienced sexual remarks like I had told you earlier. That's ridiculously high um, to be objectified that much um, while you're going through puberty is extremely hard. Um, and then large majorities reporting both cyberbullied. Story time. Um, I don't tell this story every time I present something. I don't feel that it's necessary because when you start sometimes unfolding things about your life, people pull up a tent and they have a pity party for you. However, I feel that this is relevant, um, but don't pull up your tent. So when I was in high school, I was outed. <coughs> and I am from a very small town in southern Illinois. I'm like two hours from Kentucky. It was not a good time. Um, however, I do feel that it's necessary for me to say this. I was the drum major. I was the president of the National Honor Society. I was um, the lead in all the musicals. I, I was like student body vice president, I was also the top of my class. But I was outed. And somebody outed me by making a website. And it was called, insert my birth name here, which I will not tell you, which do not ask, is a faggot.tumblr.com. And so every day, people in my high school would log on to this website and they would say, so and so just needs to kill themselves. I wish they wouldn't come back to school anymore. I'm going to fucking kill them. Excuse my language, but it's necessary. Things like that. So I got to log on to this website every day and see the things that people had to say about me. And one day, my best friend, whose name is Chris, he said, you cannot read this website anymore. What are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I think I'm probably just going to kill myself. And he said, OK, well, let's not do that. Um, please never read this website again. So OK, I'm like, all right, it's fine. I'll go back to school, because I had been playing sick. And we know that for students who are bullied, they're absent a lot. They get sick a lot. And I had been sick maybe for two weeks. And I said, OK, I got to go back to school. I got a speech tournament because I was on the speech team. I got stuff to do, and I'll be fine. And I walked into the hallway, and then people had posted things from the website into the hallway. So I thought, well, I can't do this anymore. And I went home, and I live with my dad. And I said, I can't go back to school anymore because I'm, pr I'm a pretty blunt person. And he said, well, why can't you go back to school anymore? And I said, well, that's a really long story. Um, I don't really want to get into it. But somebody started a website about me. And they want me to kill myself. And I think I might. And he was like, uh, no. So my dad turned in all these uh, papers from the website. And they found out the five students who started the site about me. And those five students were our valedictorian, our student body president, um, the king and the madrigal group, and one of the leads in our musical. They were your friends. They were my friends. And guess what they got to do? They still got to be the lead in the musical. They still got to be the magical king. They still got to stay in school. They still graduated valedictorian. They went to top universities. And I had to go and get homeschooled. Because it was easier to remove me, the transgender kid problem, than it is to deal with students' ignorance, right? So, future educators in the room, after that dismal moment, this is a learning moment for you. You've met a transgender person who has been asked to leave their school because it is easier to deal with them being away than it is to educate five students who created a website about how I should kill myself and how I should be dead and how God doesn't love me and blah, 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 because that's where I'm from and that is what people will use as ammunition. You see what I mean? Cyberbullying 
Huge, 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 huge. Why? Why is it huge? Tell me why. Because, because people don't have to show their face. They can just put anything out. That's there. right. They can say what they want. Mm -hmm. track it. Yep. Yep. We're seeing students now, especially who are LGBT, <laughs> who people will start hashtags about them. So, you know, my, I have a 13 year old cousin. It drives me crazy. And she's obsessed with the Instagram, all about the Insta. But they hashtag like it's nobody's business. And so they hashtag everything that they have to say about another person. <laughs> so, you know, they'll be like, so and so sucks, hashtag ugly, hashtag bad, hashtag fat, hashtag needs a new boyfriend. It is frustrating, but when I think when we were there in the middle school and in the high school and things like that, people just said it on like Facebook, but now it's a little more intense and more passive aggressive. Um, but cyberbullying for LGBT students is really intense because it's less, you, you can't catch the other <coughs> students as much and it's harder when you're in a classroom to say, don't say faggot, and then somebody can say it on the internet and not have any repercussions. It's also 24-7. Yep, 24-7. And, and Morgan said what you said was right, is, and that's why we see that in, um, in the suicide rate, because people used to have an escape when they went home from school, and they don't anymore. There's nowhere to go, um, and that's what's really important. So. Here's the type of bullying that we're looking at when we're referring to LGBTQ students, um, particularly the T. So we're looking at cultural, institutional, social, family, and personal history. These are the reasons why people bully. It's cultural. Um, they might see something outside of their cultural norms, what they were used to growing up. Um, institutional, kind of in the same hand social, who they're used to being socialized around. If a student's in school and they meet a transgender person, they've never met someone before, sometimes their reaction is to be harsh. And that is just because they have not been socialized in a way to understand differences. That's why it's important that we uh, socialize our youth to respect diversity, to respect differences. Family, what your family says, you can't debate it. Um, I really like hot sauce a lot um, because my dad collects hot sauce. So I put it on everything. And then by that same token, people who aren't used to different types of people don't know what to do with it. Personal history, your experiences. If you have only had one bad experience with a trans person, you're jaded. So you could have an experience with someone and you're like, I don't like them, they're transgender. And then you meet me and you're like, I don't like you, you're transgender. You base your experiences off what you've done before. It's a never ending cycle. And you can't necessarily help that, but you can correct it. And then we have control, winning, and power. These are the reasons why the bullies get the high. This is why the cycle continues because you have control of the other person. Let's use me. So when those students were writing that website about me, they knew that they had control of my life. They knew I wouldn't go to school. They knew I might drop out of this, that, and the other. They knew I might not go to college, and so on and so forth. They were winning because I dropped out of school. I went homeschooling. And they had the power because they knew they did that. And that's why kids continue to bully, because it is that high, so to speak. Because in those moments, you feel very powerful. You know what you're doing. You know you have control over another person. And although you know, we're sitting in here like, ow, why would you want to do that? Um, <coughs> it's hard, especially when you're going through those times in life when other students are picking on you, when you don't know what you're doing. Um, puberty, hello. Um, of course, the power seems like a good idea. Sidekicks. Okay, so this is all, y'all. This is what you can do. So now I've had my soapbox. I've told you what it's like in the schools. And now you're going to go, okay, so what, I, what can I do to help it? You're going to create awareness. So if you're at a meeting and somebody includes every other person in the room and they're like, yeah, and I think there's a kid and he might be transgender or she might not be transgender. I'm not really sure what to do. 
and the other person in the meeting says, well, what is that? You can say, uh -huh. I'm going to check you right there. <laughs> Actually, and you can inform them by creating awareness, by running programming in your school that's LGBT friendly, that's gender inclusive. Those are things that you want to do. Getting your educators educated, um, going to trainings, reading, reading helps. Um, those are some things too. Um, creating gender neutral restrooms. Somebody had mentioned this earlier in here, and that is a very big problem. So I work on campus, and when I go to the bathroom, I have to walk 10 minutes <laughs> to go. So I always tell the secretary, I'm like, well, go into the bathroom. I'll be back in 10, because there isn't one in the building that I work. There's not one in the building across from where I work. There is one, however, in the basement of the union. So every time I use the restroom, I come back with like an energy drink, because, you know, well, by the way, I'm out. I might as well get it. So I have to go to the 10-minute walk bathroom. On our campus, we only have gender-neutral bathrooms that are in the basements of residence halls. It's a start, but they aren't in any of our academic buildings, which can be a problem when we're talking about students. So on, by that token, they are very rarely in high schools, middle schools, or elementary schools. Now, are those like single-use bathrooms? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And those just usually say um, unisex or unigender or everyone. Some of them are really adorable in elementary schools. Mm -hmm. um, so people try to make it more inclusive because um, you know when you go to the bathroom, people will say things to you. People say things to me all the time, de depending on which one I just decide fits best. You know, if I'm in Champaign, I will always use the men's bathroom. Nobody ever questions me. But if I'm in Charleston, I love our community, but people do question me. Um, so I would just rather not risk it. Um, you will see in students in particular. Uh, many non-binary kids will have bladder infections um, because they will hold their bathroom for maybe eight to nine hours a day because they fear somebody making fun of them. And the adults do that too. I have good friends um, who do that because they don't have anywhere to go on their college campus and things like that. Um, listen and speak in a respectful way. So we, we already talked about the words that are most offensive, it, transgendered, um, and things like that, he, she, um, she male words like that are incredibly offensive and are considered slurs um, never ever use them against another person and if you hear somebody use them please correct them um, avoid perpetuating stereotypes <sighs> people have this idea in their head when we refer to transgender people that we are often just the people you see on TV. Chaz Bono, I'm sorry, is not the only transgender person to ever exist. <laughs> and neither is Laverne Cox. We live very, very normal lives. Um, and so there's certain stereotypes that are perpetuated with trans people that we all are very masculine or we are, all are very feminine or that we're pretending to be something. We're not pretending to be anything. We're only living out what we know to be true using preferred names and pronouns. This is really difficult, um, especially if you've known a student before they have come out. Um, I know for me on campus, I went by bug since I got here. And I did that so people wouldn't question um, my birth name, which is something you should never ask a trans person, side note. Um, and so when I finally said, OK, no, really, I, I go by Ben. I just did this so it would be easier for everybody. I hurt myself in that because people didn't realize why I was doing it. They didn't realize I was trying to help everybody else transition while I transitioned. Um, so using the preferred names that people tell you and using preferred pronouns. A lot of times people will say, okay, well, Ben, how do I set up that conversation with people? Make it a norm in whatever you do. So I used to be the president of Pride, and I was for two years. And whenever I started meetings, I would say, use your preferred name and use your preferred pronoun. And it just became a norm that people did and nobody ever questioned it. So I'd be like, my name's Ben and I use male pronouns. And everybody's like, oh, okay, that's fine. Um, a lot of gay straight alliances use um, those, hello, my name is, and my preferred pronoun is, name tags that you can get. And then you have the educate yourself, which you were doing to educate others. And this is um, by far the most important thing. Oftentimes, we get lost in trying to focus on ourselves that we forget to clue other people in. And I know many people feel that it is not their um, job 
so to speak, to educate others about who they are. I don't feel that way. I think that education is key. I like being a teacher. I like educating others. It's always something that's been important to me. So I have absolutely no problem gallivanting myself all over a campus to let you know about other people. Because the way I see it is the more we know, the more we can help other people. I don't like to live in a world where I believe people do things to be mean. I believe that sometimes people do things out of ignorance. So if people call me a name or people laugh at me, I always say to them, you think you're the first person that's laughed at me? You think you're the last person that's going to laugh at me? You're not. So what did you get out of that? Do you feel good? And those are the conversations that you need to have with students, with people in your workplace. Find out, why did you do that? Did, what made you feel good about that? Because chances are they're going to say nothing made me feel good about that. I didn't like it, even when we go back to that cycle. Educating others is the key. And then superpowers. So I know a lot of people will wonder what are some um, resources we can tap into in schools. Um, statewide, these are the best. Um, trans Youth and Family Allies, PFLAG, Trans Youth Equality Foundation, Trans Youth Support Network, and Illinois Gender Advocates. We do live in the heartland. We are in the Midwest. And there are not an abundance of resources for non-binary students, let alone LGBT students. They just really don't exist right now. Um, they are grassroots programs in our areas. Um, I have good friends who are doing trans youth work out of Cincinnati, and there are small groups in Champaign. I have a card if you want to contact me. I can send those to you. Um, but those are things that, that don't, are not as prevalent in our area. Now, if you go to Chicago, however, tons and tons and tons of support for LGBTQ youth, especially trans youth. There are many, many centers just dedicated um, to those causes. And OK, so I think we've got just a few seconds for questions. Do you have questions? And you can ask me anything um, that you would ask a friend. Um, is it bad if other people use? No. No, they're for everybody. Okay. Yeah, that's an, that's an everybody thing. You got to go to the bathroom. You just got to go to the bathroom. I'm not going to discriminate against anybody. Anything else? Do you feel good about it? Yes? Okay. Um, what are some ways when you were growing up and you were in school? Because I know sometimes when teachers split uh, groups up or whatever, they'll be like, okay. Uh, you pass these papers out to the girls, or you pass these papers out to the boys, mm -hmm. or like girls on this side, boys on this side, we're in these girls versus boys games. Mm -hmm. As teachers, what are some ways that we can make that easier on students? Because, I mean, we might not know if the mm -hmm. students sitting in our classroom, it might be visible on the parent, and it might not. Exactly. And that's a really good point, is that you're not always going to know, <coughs> so that's why you need to be <laughs> inclusive. Um, things that I would tell educators is try not to do boys and girls. Um, shirt color, height, um, things like that, favorite food, what type of shoes you're wearing, those are good ways to split up kids. I wish when I was younger that I would have known that it was okay. Um, just because of where I'm from, it wouldn't have ever even been discussed. I think had I been from a northern area or a more progressive place that it, I wouldn't maybe have had the, quite the traumatic experience that I did. Um, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm not happy that it happened to me, um, but I'm grateful that I've had this experience that lets me know how to help others. Um, and I think that that's really a good blessing for me. So I think that I wish, though, more than anything, I would have had teachers' support. Because I didn't have any family support, and I went to school for my support. And then when that was done, it was all over for me. So those are students who you really... <laughs> grasping at straws, I need your support, it would have been good to know. A good way to do this is to become safe zone trained or to do LGBT training and put it in your doorway or put it on your desk. Have subtle hints. Um, include LGBT things in your history months um, and things like that. The more you talk about it, if you're okay 
then you let other students know it's okay to disclose to you and that you're a safe person for me. They're not going to hurt me. They know that I, they're doing this out of my best interest. Did you know a person like that? I did, actually. Um, I had a drama coach, because don't all theater kids have their favorite theater teacher? Um, and I did, and, and she was really, really great. And um, ironically, in my town, uh, this is, you can laugh at this, I promise. Um, my PE teachers were married, and they were both women, and they went to my church. And so I, was, I remember like climbing over the back pew, and I was like, I really need to talk to you about something, <laughs> like in the middle of church. Um, so that's something, too. Just make it known to your students. But yeah, I had a really great drama teacher. So she's still a good friend. How would you go about um, like dealing with or handling students <coughs> who, because I'm from like a small town like you, and I know that there are parents who probably wouldn't appreciate, you know, mm -hmm. that, the whole situation. Like, how would you handle parents like that? <coughs> um, so I do some stuff at Charleston High School, and a lot of the students are like, well, we can't do anything because we're going to make everybody else's parents mad. Um, I think the best way that I have seen other people handle it, because I haven't been in that classroom setting myself, is that they just send a no home. Like, listen, we're going to be covering this, this, this today, and it's okay if you don't want your student to be involved. We're just going to go into this room, and they can do this. Um, because you don't want to compromise who people are and what their values are, but you do want to to have students who are tolerant um, despite of that. I'm just curious um, because, you know, those people who have the Bible issue, mm -hmm. the Bible doesn't really say a thing about trans. No, and what's interesting, <laughs> lucky me, yeah, what's interesting about that, um, and I know that those of you who work in schools will get a lot of this, is that it Trans people are much more <coughs> accepted in the church. We can actually be ordained. I know this because I'm being ordained currently. Um, we can actually get ordained, whereas um, in other ministries, LGBTQ people can't. Um, like, I'm Methodist, so in, when you're a Methodist, you can't be openly gay, lesbian, or bisexual and then get ordained. Um, however, if you're trans, it's totally cool. Um, so, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I think if people, I know, there's like a silver lining there, isn't there? I think if people are using that argument, um, I would just urge them to explore that literature themselves. And, you know, you can't change that stuff. And you wouldn't want to try, because that's exactly how when people are like, no, you're not trans, you're just confused. And that's exactly what you would be saying to somebody else. But you're right, it's not mentioned at all. <laughs> Lucky me. Anything else? You can feel free to talk to me after. I, I have a business card now. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm pretty important these days. Um, you can always email me. If you see me on campus, please say hi. Um, I don't... Hey, ben, do you have a middle name? Yes. Yeah, you got to choose a perk. Yes. Yeah, there is a perk in that. I have a middle name. It's Scott because that's my dad's first name, and I want a son, so I want to name him. I want to keep a middle name. Oh, there's that. Yeah, so I was really back and forth. There are some cool things about being trans, and that is you don't have to deal with a name your parents hate. You get to pick it. So, so I picked it after my favorite musical character, typical um, Benjamin Stone from Follies by Stephen Sondheim. Dork key. <laughs> That's okay. And I have 500 Pez dispensers, so keep that going. Yeah, yeah, really. It's a little bit of a problem. My girlfriend's like, so what are we going to do with those if we ever move in together? And I was like, well, we're going to display them, obviously, <laughs> everywhere. They're going to be in the bed. You're going to open up your drawers. They're going to be everywhere. OK, well, that's all I have for you. I think there's an evaluation. Yes, yeah. OK. So I don't, am I allowed to be in here while that happens? Yes. OK. Yes. I just didn't want you guys to. Well, thank you. You guys were great. <laughs>